All right, hello and welcome to the fourth Galvanizing Technology Committee webinar. I am Ken Landau, staff engineer at AIST. And this, this webinar will feature a hot heat balance to check entry strip temperature. As with all AIST events, there, we do have antitrust compliance. Do not discuss with others your or competitors pricing, pricing procedures, or anything that might affect pricing, such as costs, discounts, terms of sale, profit margins, or anticipated wage rates. Do not make statements about your own pricing or those of competitors, and do not talk about what individual companies plan to do in particular markets or with particular customers. We also have anti-harassment policy, which is listed there. Generally be nice to everybody. And the things to know, the attendee audio has been disabled. We're asking that all questions go through the question and answer feature so that it stays on the recording and we have a listing of it. That Q and A button should be at the bottom of your screen. If you put your mouse down there, you'll see Q and A. Again, please use that for your questions and answers. The host and moderator will determine which questions are presented to the presenter. And that will be at the end of the pre presentation. This session is being recorded and will be available on demand replay on, our, on AIST's website in about a week. If there's any technical difficulties, you can contact training at AIST.org. We do ask that no photos or recordings of the presentations be done. So it's strictly prohibited. And let me introduce the moderator, Dr. Frank Goodwin. Since his retirement from the International Zinc Association in June of 2020, Frank Goodwin has been an active as an independent consultant on issues related to zinc production, downstream processing and use. Before this, he served as Director of Technology and Market Development at the International Zinc Association. Goodwin joined the International Lead Zinc Research Organization, ILSRO, in 1982 and was Executive Vice President of ILSRO at the time of the merger between ILSRO and ISA in 2004. He earned his SM and science degrees in material engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, together with his BS degree with distinction in material sciences and engineering from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He is the author of several US and foreign patents and more than 400 technical publications and contributions to books. His service to the steel industry includes chairmanship of the Global Galvatech Conference Series and founding chair of the AIST Galvanizing Technology Committee, for which he continues to serve as the paper's co-chair. He is listed in the who's who in science and engineering in similar directories. His awards include the nice, oh, so, sorry, the Nicelius Award for of North American Die Casting Association and Nevison Award for the Galvanizers Association, the EGGA pin for the European General Galvanizers Association and life membership in Wire Association International. And with that, Frank, I'll leave you to introduce our presenter. Okay, thanks very much, Ken, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, so, uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, this is a event sponsored by the AIST Galvanizing Technology Committee. Uh, it's uh, uh, too bad we have to meet only this way online, but uh, I hope to meet uh, many of you in person at the AIS Tech Conference where we do have a Galvanizing Technology uh, Committee uh, sponsored session on Tuesday, uh, June 29th in Nashville. 
So uh, that's uh, we'll, where we'll hear the latest and the greatest uh, about uh, galvanizing at AI as tech coming up. One more thing is that we do have a, a GTC sponsored session at the MSNT, the Material Science and Technology Conference in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, the week of uh, October 17 this year. The deadline for the call for papers for that is March 15, a couple of days from now. And so far, I've only seen three abstracts. So uh, we're looking to have a good GTC uh, session at MSNT in Columbus in October. And I encourage you to uh, get an abstract, and I'd be very happy to look at that and uh, welcome you into the session. So now turning to uh, today, uh, we have uh, Michel Dubois with us, and he'll be uh, presenting his uh, webinar, Online Pot Heat Balance to Check Strip Entry Temperature. Michel received a master's degree in metallurgy from Liège University in Belgium in 1977. He's been in charge of all types of process and product expertise for uh, what was then CMI and now is John Cockerell. Uh, he's worked in the training of uh, process and uh, metallurgy, uh, process expertise for new products and, and projects, and technical audits of existing lines to improve quality and productivity. He worked on hot dip galvanizing processing for 30 years at Arslor Middle, and then joined uh, CMI, now John Cockerill, in 2007 as a hot dip uh, coating expert. He's published numerous papers dealing with the various aspects of the hot dip galvanizing process, including galvanizing pot management, pot hardware, wiping, strip vibration, and other topics. He's now retired from John Cockerell, but is still working as a consultant. So welcome to Michelle. Thank you. So um, let's go to... Okay, you see my screen? Is it okay? I will put. Uh, voilà. Perfect. Okay. 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 So today I would like to talk about the heat pot balance. Uh, I already talked about that in uh, Galvatech, as you will see. So that I will remind you what it is in detail. But also uh, the feedback of all the exercises I have conducted, because it looks simple. It is not always simple, but it's a very good tool. And I hope I will convince some of you to, to, to use that practice uh, in future, because it's easy. Yes, last time, if you remember, we discussed about strip temperature measurement uh, with Williamson. We see that uh, we are sensitive to emissivity and so on. But my experience show that really the entry strip temperature is really is usually not as correct as you believe. Okay, so um, it's indeed. Let me just move this up. Heat pot balance is co considered as an easy way. I know many people who try to do that, but the standard method that is being used is typically running a dedicated trial. It means that you put a lot of people all around the line and, um, and you wait and, and you count everything. It is based on dedicated trials I said. It, it used to be done in four to six hours in such a way that you have some, uh, some average. Uh, and inductors, you know, um, uh, on and off. Uh, ingot charging practice is sometimes uh, not so good. So it means that you never know exactly what is the amount of uh, zinc that is melted, especially when you, at the end of the period, if the ingot you have introduced fully melted or not melted. And also you may have a pot level variation. So uh, this method, I don't like. It is not so easy to operate in practice due to line mix product. I see that some are willing to run the same specification during four hours. It's impossible today. You have so, so big variation of the mix product and of the strip you have to process that, uh, that uh, it's impossible to run the six hours for the same specifications. And also uh, it's a high level of methodology that is required. I've done that myself and it is not easy. It is not easy. So that's why in practice, people used to do the heat pot balance only once a year at the best, at the best. And usually uh, those who have done that uh, never do, do that a second time. So I have proposed and the full description of that has been in Galvatech 2013. 
and it was based on the development of an automatic heat balance. I like automatic because it's easy. It's simple, easy to run without any specific skill and training. Can be run at any time, any time. It means uh, uh, you say, oh, well, I would like to have the heat balance of uh, last year. It's possible, it's possible. I would like, and I've been asked this, uh, let's compare the heat pot balance last year and this year. I would like to see if there is a difference. And this is based on available data acquisition system that everybody has now. Uh, typically, there is the, the, the famous IBA, IBA system, but there are others. So everything is recorded constantly. So all this is available. And so the advantage of that is no specific schedule or manpower required. It means that you will take the classical data available. It makes possible the estimation of the true heat loss from parameter to pot. And I want to insist on that. It's very important. It's very important because you have two unknowns in the system. It is the heat loss and the offset of the parameter in case there is one. And possibly to estimate the true error in strip and reading. This is, of course, this is the target. And it, it can be run every month if required. And I would recommend you to do this once a month only to check process drift. Because when the process drifts smoothly, you never see the difference. And so in galvanizing, there are so many processes in the line that once upon a time, you have very cr big crisis of defect and you don't know how to start. And you just look at how it is today. You are not able to compare to what it was one year before. And so um, this is a big advantage of, of following with easy system the drift, because let's suppose, for example, a parameter has um, some dust on the, on the glass, as it has been proposed by Williamson last, last time. This covering, I mean, the, the transparency of, of the lens will decrease progressively. So it means that you will not see anything at all with time. So the principle is easy. You just count the in and the out. What is the heat input? It's steel. It is easy. It is a steel heat capacity. So it means uh, tons per hour, including the, 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 the the enthalpy of the steel compared to zinc, compared to zinc pot temperature, and the inductors. The inductors usually are operating high power, low power. Other systems are continuous, but it's not so frequent, especially on old lines. And if we look at what what is a heat consumption, of course, it is the heat loss, and I will discuss that a lot. And the zinc melting, the, the, the zinc that is melt. So this include, of course, coating weight and include also the dross, because keep in mind that typically the dross come for, it depends on coding, average coding weight, but the dross, top dross amount, I like, I prefer the word skimming. Uh, uh, that I, I publish a couple of papers about the top skimming. So the typical range is 15 gram per square meter. So it gives you an average of uh, 10 to 20 to 12% of the low of uh, the loaded zinc, so it is not it is not nothing. It means that you if you consume 100 grams per square meter, uh, the top dross will come will come for about 12 to 14 grams per square meter. It depends on line speed and so on. I will not discuss that. Uh, of course, the assumption is that the strip temperature out of the pot is equal to the pot temperature. It's impossible for the strip to, to have a different temperature, as we will see later on, uh, because of the high uh, conductivity, the high heat transfer that is in the pot. Even in Galva room, where we know that the strip temperature is much lower than the pot temperature, the strip exit at the strip temperature. So um, we have also in and out, that's true. But if we are considering a period of time, we have to compensate also or to, or to take in consideration the pot temperature variation. If the pot temperature at the beginning of the period is 460 and is 462 at the end, but it's a certain amount of calorie that are involved in that. And also zinc level variation. I mean that if, if uh, you have to keep in mind that one tons typically, uh, this is rough figures, but one ton of zinc 
uh, is about 10 millimeter of zinc level on the pot. It depends on the pot size, but this is the average. This is just to give you figures. So I would like that we discussed about the area involved and that the key, it is a key to understand that uh, in the result. So I have typically two, two situations. This one is where the strip temperature is measured just before the pot. So we count the amount of heat that's here. And of course we estimate that the strip is coming out here. So in that case, we see that uh, the heat loss has to involve all this area. But in case the strip temperature is measured at the top row, at the hot bridle, and it is, it is quite usual and frequent, sometimes with wedge situation. So the heat loss is indeed uh, all the snout area, including the pot area, and including the wiping conditions, because all the gas flow that is flowing here on the zinc pot. Uh, induce some uh, heat loss, of course. Huh? So the balance is for the total area from the last temperature measurement and the exit of the pot. It's important to keep that in mind. So because you never know the exact heat loss and that's the trick. Domain depends on where the strip temperature is of course measured. So that's why the heat loss can be totally different from one line to another one only because you change the location of the temperature measurement. So what, are, what is involved in the loss? It is pot and its inductors, of course, the snout and wiping and wiping. So it means that if you are considering heat loss though that you measure during line stop, you make a big mistake. You make a big mistake. Let's compare situation between uh, a running line and, um, and line stop because usually everybody takes heat loss is about 250 kilowatts and that's the average value for a pot at 460, unless it is very big. If you have a very big pot, it's a little bit higher. So it is two, between 250 and 300, depend on, on your pot size. But when the line is top of call, you have zero heat losses now. So it's a pity. Loss by inductors. Well, the, we know that inductors are like fins indeed. And so we expect that the higher will be the firing rate of the inductors, the higher will be the heat loss also in the cellar because the average temperature of the inductor is higher. The pot, no problem. Usually this one is, is equal when the line is running or when the line is stopped. But of course, we have no uh, cooling from the, from the wiping uh, process because we are not wiping so the airflow is not there. So it is clear that the estimation of heat loss only based on what you may have, uh, what, what you may use uh, and you have measured during line stop is very different from what exists really on a, on a line running. So in practice, you have two unknowns. So it means that you have the heat loss and I make a big discussion on that. Huh? Keep in mind also that depending on the, the, the thickness of the top draft that you may have on the pot, the heat loss could be different. Why? Because if you have a very thick, thick draw, top skimming, I mean, so the emissivity being about uh, 0.4, and I invite you to measure that. And most of the loss is from the surface. So it means for a pot, it's about 100 kilowatt only because you have a thick, uh, a thick uh, skimming. In case it is very clean, it's totally different. You have 35. You can make this type of computation. So, um, so that's one. And of course, for the snout, it will depend on heat insulation. We know that everybody claims that the snout is heat insulated. Believe me, it is never perfect. It's almost impossible. The shoe is, first of all, not heat insulated. That's one point. In case you have a bellow because you are retractable snout, it is not heat insulated also. So you should not believe the temperature of the, of the walls of the snout and also the atmosphere inside the snout is, is 450. I invite you to reread the paper I publish on the HNX flow inside the snout that is mostly driven, that flow is mostly driven by the buoyancy because temperature is not uniform. So the error, of course, uh, the error in temperature is, is 
used to be constant. I mean, let's suppose you are running an IF steel. I'm not talking about the advanced high strength steel. So in case we run uh, IF steel, so it is only the, the balance, I mean, the heat flow that is, that is bring to the pot by the strip is mostly dependent on mass flow. The higher the mass flow, the more heat you put in the pot. So uh, also keep in mind that you measure the strip temperature and a single point. In case the temperature is not uniform across, it means that let's suppose you have hot edges for any type of reason or cold edges, you will not see that, you will not see that. So that's why you have to see and to check the sensitivity of the heat pot balance with the, with the strip width. This is what explained also in the, in the basic paper. So you have two unknowns. So if you have two unknowns, it means that a single exercise done in a single four, four hour period will never give you the exact solution. You need to do it at different times with variable mass flow, with different mass flow. And this is the only way to, to have access to the two unknowns uh, that are heat loss and offset of the strip temperature. So how now can we compute uh, the, the in and out? So how can we compute the melted zinc? So the zinc melted is not totally known indeed because as I told you, ingot weight is variable. So detection of ingot melted is not easy. Nobody wants to compute dross. I really complain about that because we, you should follow every, every month at least and have a rough figure of the top skimming that you produce per square meter. And I propose to compute <coughs> the zinc that is contained in kilogram per square meter considering the surface. And it's easy because in all database you have line speed and you have strip width and Coating weight, and of course, coating weight is fully traced because you have to warranty the coating given to the customer. And the, the scanning gauge is giving you exactly the coating weight at any time. So it can be an average. Now we can discuss about the exact way to proceed, but all this is accessible. It's very, very easy to access. So now, do we make a big error? And this is a sensitivity analysis I've done. Let's suppose you make one gram per square meter error in the zinc estimation, because the stop skimmings are never known at plus minus, let's say three grams per square meter to side. So only one gram give you an error of 0.7 kilowatt hour. So you see it's really low. So even you make a slight mistake here that you miss a couple of gram per square meter, this is not going to change a lot in the results. Zinc level also, you can make the exercise and it's, it's referred to eight kilowatt hour considering that one ton is, is 10 millimeter level. But later on, I will show you that the uh, zinc level variation uh, gives you a, gives me and you, in case you, you practice the method I, I propose will give you some nightmare. So what is the target now? Huh? So I made a simple calculation just to see, let's suppose we have five degrees C error for 50, for a line running 50 tons per hour. It means that the heat input is 45 kilowatt hour. So it gives you that Considering that, that the temperature difference here versus the mass flow, let's suppose I'm running 50, 50 tons an hour. Uh, if I made a mistake of five degrees, so the, the balance will be off by 40, in the range of 50 kilowatts an hour. So, but in case it is 10 degrees and 10 degrees, you know, it's huge. It is very huge. So the, the error can be more than 100, more than 100 kilowatt an hour. So it means that um, the method should allow you to get the entry strip temperature at plus minus five degrees when everything is perfect, when everything is perfect. That's the target, not plus minus one, forget about it. But plus minus five, I think we can have it, we can have it. And it, it's, it's really free because, and I will show you, because you only use the process data. So uh, difference between input and output, in case you count the input, you count the output, 
of course, you get, well, the result is not equal. It's, it's normal. Why is it different? So first is incorrect estimation of strip temperature. And that's, of course, the target. Incorrect estimation of heat, of heat loss. That's a second. And pot and all the section of the pyrometer, including wiping also. An incorrect estimation of zinc consume. But as we have seen, the, this does not have a lot of impact. Impact of pot temperature variation and zinc level. You know, sometimes uh, because the, the inductors are running high power, low power, the pot temperature always vary plus minus two degrees, one degree. So it's not on a 250 pot ton. Well, it's, it's a, a big amount of heat anyway, anyway. And of course, you can have an incorrect estimation of power. What does I mean with that? And I've seen that also because <clears throat> you have some, everybody has, has uh, had the inductor failure somewhere. And so uh, sometimes you change the coil because, uh, because you, you need to change the coil of the inductor. And fortunately, it has not the same specification from that uh, you had initially. Also, uh, usually the, you can have a high firing, low firing, but the exact kilowatt that is consumed by the inductor may change because of the channel size and so on. So I invite you to verify the exact kilowatt that are, that are produced, I mean, in high power and low power uh, before you run this type of uh, exercise. So uh, you know that uh, strip and tree temperature, of course, it impacts uh, directly intermittent formation, it impacts gross production, all this you know. So um, problem of strip emissivity is, is a big issue, huh? especially if we are facing the parameter. If we are using watch pyrometer, we increase dramatically the length of, of, of uh, of casing that, that has uh, some heat loss. So, uh, and there is a drift and uh, the risk of drift is indeed very high. And that's why I recommend you run this methodology. Now, that acquisition, it looks nice. Unfortunately, when you look in the detail and you want to process that, the data are never as good as you believe. That's for example, a simple exercise, you see, well, there are crazy numbers here. A single line in 400,000 line, there is one single false line with those uh, crazy numbers because the system was running improperly. In case you have an automatic system, what are you doing? What are you doing with that? So it means that you have to filter and to remove that. You have two options or you recreate the missing line or you say, well, I skip it. I skip it. All the periods will, will be skipped off. And this is the preferred method because we have so huge amount of data that in case we, we skip some period of time, there is absolutely no problem. We still have a lot available. The other issue is also what about line stop? Because you plan the trial, but unfortunately line stop is part of life, is part of life. So what do we do? This is not normal process condition. So I think that we have to reject all conditions that are not normal. It could be, for example, because the coding weight is negative. Why is it like that? I don't know. I don't know, but that's practice. It can be zero. The zinc gauge maybe is under calibration. So all this must be rejected in such a way that the database that you are using is really clean. Right? And that the principle, for example, uh, from my side, I say, well, all line speed below 40 meters per minute are rejected. I do not consider those period of time. Also, in case coding weight is out of the range, 10 to 500 grams. But this can be, for, for if, if it is only an automotive line and you are never running heavy codings, of course, you, get, you change those values. You cannot accept any negative value unless you know that they are. Sometimes for zinc level, you may get a negative value. Also big level variation. You know that if you have a laser sensor and when you remove the, when you remove the top skimming, uh, the laser is going to measure something very strange, very strange. All this must be rejected. So the proposal that I have is 
not to estimate the incorrect data, but just keep the period. We have so big amount, so big amount that we don't care about scrapping uh, all, all the data that are not uh, reliable, let's say. So we have to define a balance will never be done in five minutes. So we have to look for a defined period. What is the right period of time? We can take a very long, but the longer the period of time we are considering, the higher the risk of rejection. Because the principle of rejection I showed you, if I have a single line that is that has to be rejected, I reject all the period and go to the next one. It's automatically done. It's automatically done by the, by a software that uh, you may write. But if, if, if you take a period of 12 hours, the risk is very high. If the period is too short, it's exactly the opposite. Well, you, you may be very sensitive to peaks and error, uh, very light error because of uh, high firing, low firing. And, and so my practice, in practice, I would say, don't go below two hours periods and don't go over six hour periods. It seems to be a maximum uh, in order to get a significant uh, uh, valid period, I say. And as far as sampling rate is considered, uh, you know that EBA can give you uh, data every uh, 0.05 second. It, it means every 50 milliseconds, forget about it. You are not able to manage so big, so big data. So uh, my recommendation is just take uh, data sampling rate every two seconds, even every 10 seconds is enough. And it depends. I've done both. I've done both. I've done uh, this type of exercise with one second sampling rate, with 10 second sampling rate, uh, and it does not change a lot. It does not change a lot. But the, if you consider six hours period, you see uh, for, for 10 days, and I will show you the example later on of things that I've done. Uh, well, if you are take, considering the full data of 10 days of production, well, the, the database becomes really, really big and it gives you more problem than solution. So the principle is now for the, for the four hours period, every five seconds or two seconds, you will add the data and compute the balance. So you add all heat is coming in, all the consumption of zinc, and at the end of the period, you make the total and you'll see if you get the results. And you have two unknowns. You have two unknowns. It is heat loss and you have uh, offset of strip temperature. And so you check in order to verify that you are at the right entry strip temperature, you check the, that the result of the balance is not dependent on mass flow. Because the higher the mass flow for a defined offset temperature, you will have more heat. So it means that the balance will be, will be dependent on mass flow. So the target that I have is plus minus 100 kilowatt. We will see in practice how it looks like. And in case you have points that are totally out of that, you have to analyze that one by one. And uh, I, I'll show you some of the results. So I wrote a special routine for that. What do we see? For example, it's a routine where you see for every five seconds, I add the, the, the temperature input, the coding input, the speed. When I know the speed, I know the surface. If I know thickness, I know the mass flow. And that's also iterative, including everything. And of course, I look at the entry of the period, what is pot temperature initial, also pot level and initial. You can automatically select, for example, is it a, a galvanized or zinc magnesium run? It automatically, so you can take a, a, a one month database and the system only by quick sele automatic selection can make the heat balance on what, what you want. Huh? That's an exercise, for example, that I can show you. I took uh, 10 days of production. And um, this is for, for one customer that I have. This line was running. Uh, it's a full RTF radio tube furnace running GIGA. And the customer said, well, I would like you make a heat pot balance during this period of time. That's, that's fault nine, those 15 days. And when you look at the data, you see 
The speed vary, of course, it is normal production. And of course, we see that here we have a line stop and that's speed versus time. Uh, for you see each each dots is uh, it's time in second. So this is because it's a changeover from GI to GA because it's a two part system. And so I, I have run the heat pot balance for GI and GA. Here I will show you the GI results. And with data collected every five seconds, you see that thickness varies. So most probably this area where thin coating very th Thin strip is mostly where exposed were produced. And at the end, uh, maybe, maybe advanced high strength steel. I don't know. If you trace that and you know the, the steel code, you, you, you can have more data. But I don't need a special processing, I mean, special field, special uh, organization of the, of the run to make this. I just take the rough data and you run then the exercise and you put heat loss first, uh, 250 kilowatts. Just remind you that the balance is a kilowatt of strip, kilowatt of pots, high, low power. And you know when it is high during five seconds, you know how much it is. And if it is low, you know how much it is also. Zinc loss, including uh, dross also, and the heat loss, that's uh, including the stuff. So you see, that's the results of the heat pot balance versus mass flow. Oh, well. What can I do with that? Heat loss versus considering 250 kilowatts, that's the value that is usually from, uh, that you get from a line stop. So first of all, I would recommend you, you reject all the data. Well, even with that, I have only 65 valid period for, for, I think it was done in two hours. It's two hours period here uh, where I miss, uh, I'm not shown that. It's, it's two or four hours, but I think in, in this exercise, it was two hours, that my standard value. So uh, you see, it means that I have rejected a lot of data, but nevertheless, nevertheless, only for all this period, I still have 65 good points that uh, fulfill the first filter that I'm considering. The second is, well, I said I have to reject all pot level variation. And my experience is that if, I will show you why later on, uh, it is not while working with that. If level variation is more than three millimeters and pot temperature higher than uh, two millimeters, you will get problem. Oh, well, it's much more consistent. And we get a slope here. You see how it looks? So you change it and you say, well, I need to correct the entry strip by seven degrees. In that case, it is flat. But of course, I've got an offset. So it's because the heat loss, I misestimated. The estimation is incorrect. So instead of 250, I have to set 370 kilowatts for heat loss. And now all the data are flat here and centered at zero. And I consider that that's nine. But from all the 10 days, only 30, only 37 period of two hours are valid for the consideration that um, I mean, there is only one single point that you have to analyze just to verify what happened in that case. But nevertheless, you can check that uh, the balance here does not depend on pot temperature variation. Here it is a kilowatt related to, to level variation. Oh, that's strange point. That's exactly the one that we had previously. That's this one. Oh, well, uh, that's here it is. Well, well it was Bob. And but relation with zinc consumption, the, the average is everywhere. So it means that it seems you are not sensitive to the coating weight that you are called that the wiping condition. Behind the kilowatt of zinc is hidden the wiping effect, is wiping the wiping. So you can also follow how is the balance with time. I mean, here every point is two hour period. And of course, all the other that are skipped. And you see that there is the famous point that we have not expressed is really single here. Everything is more or less flat. And we have one point here that's uh, that's out of the game. Right? And at that time, we see that the pot of the, and this is because the kilowatts were giving much more higher power. Oh, well, why is that? And when you analyze, you can see that it's related to pot level variation here. So. And the exit thickness, we see it is not related to thickness because thickness is, is, uh, was, was very good everywhere. So this point is not related to a very specific 
thickness. We could check if it is not also related to a specific steel grade in case you have the data available. So also when all the data are reprocessed and I say, well, I only keep the pot level radiation plus minus one millimeter. So the, I have only 27 good cases that are valid. But in that case, there is now the balance is in the range that I can get well centered. It is related to, as I told you, an offset of seven degree, 350 kilowatts heat loss. And we see that it is independent on strip width. So it means that I expect that the heat, the strip temperature is uniform across. So that's good, that's good. And that's what I consider that uh, the heat pot balance is, is good. So I've done the exercise on many lines, believe me. Second line, this, is, this was first exercise on a single line, on another line for another customer. I've done this, you see, for every month here, March, April, May, and so on, followed all the kilowatt that has been consumed, the entry temperature measured, the temperature, <clears throat> the offset coming from the balance. So it means the, the true entry strip was this one, those are the heat law that I had to adjust for, for good value. And you see that with time, indeed, huh? that's here, heat loss, exit of temperature. Here, there has been a drift. And indeed, at that time, I contacted the maintenance people and I said, well, something is wrong because it's not a one point. It's like an SPC card. When the drift, if, if different days, I mean. And so they recalibrated the parameter, and that's why it dropped down immediately. Immediately, And you can see that here, all the data is more or less the same. I mean, the, the mixed product of the line is more or less the same during all, during one year. This is more about one year. And the standard deviation of the heat balance is always, it has to be below 50 kilowatts to, to consider it is uh, consistent. Only one value here is not, is not as good. It's not as good. I've, that's another way to show you versus months. Here, the, how was that uh, the, the pot temperature variation? How was that? Do, are they still? Uh, following my recommendation, I mean the pot temperature should not change. You can verify that also the level variation in two hours. And so it is a difference between beginning of the period and of the period is, is still okay. And also you can see if one steel grate is, is giving you an offset. For example, the grade 35 is always in the upside. The 42 is well balanced up and down. So I'm sure that uh, advanced high strength see some of them will show that the heat balance is always off that. And I've seen that on one. Another exercise here, and uh, I will not review, this one has been uh, published fully in, two, in the Galvatech paper. And in that case, I had to set the heat loss 390 kilowatts. You see, it's much higher. And also saying no effect of wiping, no effect of, uh, uh, of uh, really zinc consumption. There are different ways to compute that. And also uh, on another line, fourth line, after tuning uh, the procedure described is, uh, I had to show to, to find that the heat loss was about 500 kilowatt. You see how big it is? But in that case, the strip temperature was measured in the hot bridle. Well, uh, it's an offset of 10 degrees and 500 degree, 500 degree, 500 kilowatt loss. So just to show you what it means, let's suppose that the temperature here, you make a mistake 10 degree, the snout is losing 170. And the, um, so the total here for the pot would be 300. Why 300? 250, sorry, it's uh, 250 for the pot and 50 for the wiping. That's an average that I can show you. So if you compute that, what you measure is the red point here and what is the true value is this one. So it means that when you are running very, very low uh, mass flow, the, you enter the pot much lower than the pot temperature. And we know that this is making surface defect. It is known, it is known. And if you look at the kilowatt of the pot versus the mass flow here, you clearly see that the pot consume much more kilowatt 
in case of low productivity compared to high productivity. Here you consume very low because you, the interest trip is much higher than the one you believe. And, um, and uh, on the opposite one uh, here, it's really because you enter too low. So oh, you always discover strange things, always. Also in that case, it was uh, a line running cold run and off road. He also, heat loss, 490 kilowatt, also strip temperature measured in the, in the hot bridle. You see, all the dots are, are well centered, only a single point here. And this one is when we run hot roll. And this is explained because uh, the pot temperature has been changed. Uh, okay, I don't have time to show you all the details of that, but you can see that here the kilowatt of the pot dropped down very low, and that's because the customer wanted to run hot roll at much lower temperature. That's and we we can see that hot roll is here because it is thick material. Right? Also, what are the main problem that I faced in that exercise? Because uh, it took me. Uh, I, I've discovered a lot of them. The main issue is pot temperature and level variation. Every time the pot temperature vary too much, more than plus two degrees, all the uh, zinc level vary also by, uh, during the period, during the period, by more than, than uh, two millimeters, you always have poor results. Even by making the correction for the heat corresponding to the variation of enthalpy in both cases, you never get exactly the same, uh, you, you never have that uh, properly. Uh, uh, unstable value also in case of level, sometimes as I said, uh, you get the shaky value. That's the example. Let's suppose this is a level measurement versus time. This is the rough measurement that you get. You see those peaks? In case you take the value here, it's a single point. You have to filter, so it's very tricky. From this, where you see the level versus time, you need to filter that in some way. There are different situation, and this is moved to that one. This is much more realistic. This you can use. This one you cannot use. You cannot use. It can be because a ning got there, because people were dressing or skimming the pot. So all this has to be filtered. And because you take a single point or an average at the beginning of the period or the end of the period, it's always uh, very tricky, very tricky. So in practice, pot level variation uh, by more than two millimeters always induce poor result, not clear explanation. There is something strange I will show you. Uh, so I recommend you to reject all those uh, big variation. But, and it is also the same for the pot. When you look at the data hub, uh, it's a high firing, low firing. Uh, I know that the pot supplier uh, warranty plus minus one degree, forget about it. That's how it is in reality. Uh, you see that the target is more probably uh, 462. I don't know what is a set point in that case, but the, the temperature vary between 460 and 463 or four. Uh, but we clearly see when the pot is on and out. Uh, this is the variation during eight hours. So if I'm considering the, 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 the balance from this point, uh, either this period or that period, it's totally different. So, uh, and that's interesting to show you. You see, this is a balance here at the bottom and here at the pot temperature. It seems, and I, it's difficult to explain, it's difficult to explain. That balance increased because the pot is, because the inductors are firing. And we see that the pot temperature change about 45 minutes later. So there is really, there is a, a lag, a, a delay on that. Every time you can see this point here, this point here, here we, we increase the balance and that's because of because uh, kilowatts of the pot was firing. I can show you that in the detail, but that slope really is related to that slope. So of course it, it's giving you an offset in the balance because if you make the balance here, the pot temperature is not, has not rised, has not risen enough before. So the general observation now, uh, what to say about that? Heat loss has been found between 250 and 500 kilowatts high value for watch parameter just now. Okay? 
And uh, of course, if the heat insulation of your stove change with time, you will see that that value is going to change. And I believe that it can be, it can, may change by 100 kilowatts without any problem. Usually much higher than standard value. It's important to keep in mind. That's why I insist that you make the very, the, you make the exercise on, the, on multiple data because uh, this is the only way to get the two unknowns. Temperature around seen as high as 20 degrees C in some cases. So you see, it can be very big. No effect of exact gross amount and wiping conditions. And also, um, sorry for that, I will close that. Poor global result on pot level and temperature change. Rejection rate of data is typically 50%. So 50% of the, the data are rejected because of level variation, inconsistent, night stop, or all this period of set and heat loss has never been, has been seen connected. And this is not clear. If you go back in some pictures I show you, we have seen, it seems there is a connection. I would like to continue that with uh, some customers. And the effect of advanced high stakes like DP800 on temperature, uh, on temperature error have been seen. I, I could not show you this now, but DP600 is not giving any, any problem. But DP800 in some cases, some graded show that it has an impact on, on, on the temperature reading, that's clear. Considering now snap heat loss 500 kilowatts, the temperature reading is expected diff significantly different from the interest rate temperature. This show you, the temperature difference, uh, keep in mind, you measure the strip temperature at the hot bridle, you believe that this is the entry strip. Unfortunately, there is a heat loss of 500 kilowatts. So it means that, um, that uh, the error you make uh, when you run uh, 30 kilograms uh, per, per second, you can compute that in tons an hour. So the average value is here. The error is 40 degrees. 40 degrees, you make an error of 40 degrees because between your reading and your reading is correct. But unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, you forget all the heat law that is, is after that. Huh? And also uh, the heat loss here, in case of course it is 150, it's more consistent on that. Uh, heat uh, properly, he, uh, well heat insulated snout, would be in the range of 150 to 250. So the error also in the same case, it means that the entry strip error is about 10 degrees. So let's come to the conclusion. Heat pot balance run along the production is an interesting tool to control the process and determine the true entry strip temperature. Accuracy of plus minus five degrees is consistent. It's a, it is a target, I think it's reliable. A methodology is proposed to compute the balance in normal production. That's good because it is, you don't need any specific schedule. It's simple, reliable. So it means you can, you can run that exercise once a month, once a month with process engineer and you write, a, you wrote a routine. I can also do that uh, for you in case you want. I can uh, give you some tricks on that. But keep in mind that the heat pot balance is not consistent, is not reliable if you have no mass flow variation. High quality level of data is required to avoid uh, too high rate of rejection. If you have only a question mark everywhere in the database, you can operate. And the exercise run on a too short period should not uh, be good. Stable process is required, as I said. Uh, good pot temperature and zinc level. Heat loss to consider in balance seems much higher than uh, the typical uh, heat loss of the pot. And systematic data analysis will allow uh, the identification of a lot of things. Drift of parameters, still great effect, eventual effect of line speed, incorrect coating weight measurement, unexpected increase of heat loss, example due to management of uh, insulation of, of the snow. So the target temperature where measured can be set to, to anticipate the snout heat loss, something that nobody is doing because it's very easy, it's a simple formula. Nobody is doing that. So this finish uh, the presentation. Uh, just five minutes before <laughs> before the end. Okay. So uh, very if good. there is a question. So. <laughs> okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, 
uh, was, uh, uh, I think what you have done here is uh, really shown what a challenge it is to do this. And uh, just like your one of your last slides says, uh, if we don't have good data coming in, we're not going to get uh, good answers coming out. Um, we have nothing on the uh, Q&A board uh, right now. Um, so it seems you've uh, been spared uh, until now uh, questions, but uh, we welcome anybody to uh, uh, put your questions in on the Q&A board. And, in case uh, someone uh, want to receive the slideshow, of course, I can send it. It's not an issue. Yeah, of course, the, the entire webinar will be recorded, uh, is recorded, as uh, Ken right. mentioned before, and will be available on the AIS Tech uh, right. website next week. Uh, just to also mention, uh, you talked about your Galvatech uh, 2013 paper, and that is paper number 475. So that is available uh, uh, yeah, if yeah. anybody wants that one. Uh, Michelle, you also mentioned another paper on the uh, heat exchange or the balance inside the snout. Do you remember where that was given? Uh, it is not heat exchange. It is uh, HNX flow inside okay. the snout. It was in Japan, the last one. Okay, and the Galatech 2017. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you will see that uh, the flow total is strongly dependent on the heat balance of the snout. Yeah, and great. I, think is, uh, I think that the heat insulation is not avoiding condensation. I don't believe in that. I think it is because it changed the flow. And that's yeah. my opinion. Okay, we can review that one too. So we have those two Galvatech yeah. papers from um, uh, uh, 2013 and 2017. Yeah. Okay, we do have a question up on the uh, board. Uh, and this is from Frances Blake uh, uh, from uh, Cleveland. And so uh, she is asking you, do you recommend two pyrometers for IF versus AHSS steel at the snout? So uh, the, oh, yeah. uh, do, do you think you should yeah. have two pyrometers there or uh, how, what is, uh, if you're running both AHSS uh, dual phase and others and IF, uh, do you think two pyrometers? I will tell you, I've done the exercise on one line that had uh, two parameter. Was one was a dual wave and another was a single wave. They never indicate the same value, even on IF steel. It's, it becomes a nightmare. It becomes a nightmare. <laughs> My recommendation, frankly speaking, would be to use a watch parameter because this one we know is insensitive on emissivity, provided it's well adjusted following the recommendation from Williamson who heard last, uh, last time, and to compensate for heat loss on the snout. Huh? This is the easiest way. Because it, otherwise, all the facing parameter always become dirty with the, with the zinc dust. You may become also sensitive to reflection uh, because you cannot make the screen, I mean, the ideal screen. So that would be my recommendation. Because or, or the other way is also you can change for advanced high structure. If you want, you can do this. But you have to change also the, the wavelengths. So I've never seen that uh, as well. I, I would recommend watch that. I like watch that anyway. Yeah, the well, trouble with the wedge is that you're a long way from the pot. <laughs> you have to really think about what's uh, going what on. What is the basis for setting error range in EBA? I don't understand the question. Okay, can Dominic, can you clarify what do you mean by IBA? Can you just type well, in? I, know. I know it is a system that acquisition system. It is oh, and, and the, uh, and the data system. acquisition session. Uh, uh, what is setting error range? What, what is the meaning in of that? Okay, when you're filtering data. Oh, uh, I'm not doing that through IBA. The way I process personally, I export 